Good morning. Come on in. Let's grab some seats. We're going to get started. If there aren't any more seats, there is overflow in Wardlaw Auditorium over in uh, the Education Building, and we'll be streaming uh, the lecture series in. Welcome to our summer lecture series, our first week of our summer lecture series. If the deacons will come on down for the Sunday School offering. Uh, let, me, let me draw your attention to well, what was the slideshow that will be happening every Sunday morning before the lecture series. These are pictures from uh, the 225 plus 2 celebration. Many of them Tim Hubel took, Calvin Crumps, and uh, Ashton DeBassinet have been working on that slideshow as a celebration of all God's done here. And today, actually, June 4th, uh, marks our 228th anniversary as a church. This church planted here uh, at the corner of Lady and Marion, June 4th, 1795 and a testimony to God's faithfulness uh, all these years. It's, some, it's, it's fitting to think about God's grace and goodness every day, but in particular this summer as we consider the Ordo Salutis, as we think about the order of salvation, that is the logical outworking, the logical order, the plan of God's grace in uh, his people and the salvation of his people. In eternity past, that works itself into our presence and then all the way into eternity in the future and we're looking forward to many summer lecture speakers coming and talking about different topics we'll focus less on the events of eternity past and more on what God has done in our lives and will continue to do into the future but this morning we're honored to have Dr. Mark Ross who really needs no introduction we all know him as our pastor he pastored here for many years at First Press continues to pastor and shepherd many among our flock but he also is the John R. DeWitt Professor of Systematic Theology and Associate Dean for Erskine Theological Seminary here on this campus. He has his PhD from the University of Kiel in England. And not only has he ministered among us greatly, he has taught many of our seminary students and raised up many ARP ministers and PCA ministers for that matter uh, around the, the country and the world. And he's written uh, Let's Study Matthew and the Let's Study series in the back of the Family Life Center, every week you'll see some books. Some of them have to do with the Ordo Salutis, not from speakers that will be here this summer. Some of them will be books that are written by our speakers, and you can pick that book up in the back and study the Gospel of Mark uh, this summer, thanks to Deborah Kirkland and her wonderful book service as well. We're excited to have him, uh, and before we have him up to speak this morning on union with Christ, really in some sense an overarching doctrine that works itself out in all of the Ordo Salutis. Uh, before we have him up, let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we do thank you that by your grace you set your affection upon us in eternity past, that you love your people, that you've given your son as a ransom for us, and that you will send him again to bring us home. And in all of that, Lord, we pray that you would teach us and grow us as you have shown yourself faithful, that you would help us to be faithful. And this summer, Lord, as we consider these different beautiful doctrines of our salvation, Lord, would we be caught up in a deeper love for you? And would we grow in your grace to become more like Christ, who is our head? And we pray all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. I feel uh, quite at home in a basketball court. Uh, tell the deacons, if you want to make sure the speakers get you out on time to get to worship, turn on that score clock, let it run down. Buzzer goes off at 10 minutes till 10. We'll get out of here on time every week. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm kind of used to the running down to the clock and the horn going off and, uh, and bad news coming our way. Once when I was in uh, high school, we were playing a game and we were up against the section champs. Uh, this was the last game of the season for us as well as for them before they went to the playoffs. Uh, they may as well have been a professional team as far as we were concerned because we stunk. Uh, and they were beating us by twice our score. And in fact, the game would end 100 to 50. But because they were preparing for the playoffs, they pressed us the whole last quarter. You know, full court press and whatnot, and it, I got the ball in about the uh, foul line extended, uh, and uh, they had blocked every passing lane that there was. Uh, 
and I was worried about the 10 second clock gone. Back then, we didn't have digital clocks, which gave you a kind of a more precise reading. We had those swinging arms uh, and whatnot. Well, there was a, a minute and 15 left when we took the ball out. But I saw that arm coming down, and I thought there was less than 15 seconds left. And I thought the 10-second buzzer was going to go off, and I, I had no place to pass the ball. What else would you do? I launched that baby from 65 feet out. <laughs> I just shot, boom, off it went from, you know, about right there over to that. There. And between the time I shot and uh, the ball got to the basket, I think every foul word my coach knew had come out of his mouth. <laughs> I got quite a uh, lesson in his vocabulary between now and then. But when it went right in, he just quieted down and shut up. <laughs> and to think all of that was predestined from all eternity. David mentioned uh, that you would have slideshow recalling our history of the church, uh, for which there are so many things to give thanks. Uh, before I start in on the assigned topic of uh, union with Christ, I want to draw your attention uh, to one other aspect of our history. While this is the 228th anniversary of the history of our church, this year is also the 40th anniversary of our time in the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was 40 years ago, actually in March uh, the 17th, that we were received by Presbytery, and then there was a service here, together with the Arsenal Hill Church, that also came with us into the ARP Church at that time. Uh, a particular reason for mentioning that today is that this past week, we had the farewell service for the Reverend Calvin Todd, who had been with us as a minister of visitation during uh, his retirement years after he had stepped down from more than 40 years of full-time pastoral ministry. Uh, probably few of you will know this unless you have taken time to research the history of the ARP Church, but Calvin Todd belonged to what I would call the greatest generation in the ARP Church. You know, Tom Brokaw spoke of the greatest generation as the World War II generation that didn't just save our country, but saved the world from tyranny. Well, the greatest generation in the ARP Church saved us from liberalism. The ARP Church had been drifting to the left across the previous 50 years, but through the prayers of many people, God moved in a gracious way during the late 60s and the decade of the 70s especially, and he raised up a new generation of people. Calvin would have just been one. His brother Charles was another. Boyce Wilson, who has been supported by this church. John Carson, who has been supported by this church, uh, who served uh, not only as pastors, but as missionaries and so on. Uh, their fathers, their mothers, they saved the ARP church from its leftward drift, and we are one of the few redemption stories of denominations that had drifted to the left and came back to a biblical center. And uh, it was a privilege for us to have Dr. Calvin Todd among us uh, in these years. He was one who had labored faithfully uh, during that period of time to restore us to the scriptures. And it meant that when our church found that the Presbyterian Church U.S. had drifted too much to the left and was about to unite with the Northern Presbyterian Church from which I came, where I grew up, the ARP Church provided a home for this church, uh, a place where the confession of faith that we had held to throughout our history was being maintained and indeed revived, renewed, loved again in the ARP Church. And we have uh, continued uh, with that. And our church, I believe, has found a very good home uh, in this denomination. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, perhaps just one evidence uh, of that, the fundamental concern was the authority of Scripture, which is 
foundation for all that we preach and teach here. We preach and teach the truth of God, not our own ideas, not those of others, but founded upon the word of God. And that confessional basis was being eroded, practically had already been eroded in the Southern Presbyterian Church, in the Northern Presbyterian Church, but with that union was gonna become uh, a book of confessions that entirely obliterated the foundation of the Westminster Confession of the Faith that holds out the doctrine of inerrancy uh, to that point. And Erskine Seminary itself uh, had moved away uh, from that affirmation. But today, we all affirm the doctrine of inerrancy. And what a surprise it is with that controversy and our leftward drift that when Ligonier published the Reformation Study Bible, it was an Erskine Theological Seminary professor who wrote the article on the doctrine of inerrancy. What a strange thing. But it was God's testimony to bring us back to where we are. Well, we've got the great topic coming out of the authority of Scripture of union with Christ. And as David already hinted, this is not just first in a logical series. This doctrine is foundation to the whole series. It was actually in the 17th century that the phrase ordo salutis, the Latin term for the order of salvation, came into vogue. And one of the most prominent works during that period of time, Dr. Thomas mentioned in his little uh, intro to the series in First Things a few weeks ago, was the work of the father of English Puritanism, uh, William Perkins, who wrote a big book called The Golden Chain. Uh, and the idea had come from Romans 8, 29 and 30, whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, whom he justified, these he also glorified. And those five steps along the way, in which it is shown that those who are glorified at the end are precisely all those who were justified, precisely all those who were called, precisely all those who had been predestined, precisely all those who had been foreknown, really meaning foreloved in the eternal counsels of God before the foundation of the world. This was the foundation for Christian assurance. And that five step along the way was viewed as a chain of five golden links along the way. But of course, in working out of salvation, there's far more than just those five links. But if we keep the image of the chain in mind, we may get the idea that these are all sequential things, that one follows upon another, and in some cases that is quite true. But as we approach the doctrine of union with Christ, I'd like to set before you another image, and that is the image of a tree and its branches. Of course, I'm getting that image from John chapter 15 of the vine and its branches. But the main trunk of the tree is union with Christ. And then it branches out into all the other parts of the order of salvation. If you want this in writing, the very best book for you to get this summer, because it will pretty much chart out every lecture that will come after that, is John Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. And he'll walk you through it. In fact, you can skip my lecture and just go read his uh, thing and tune out at this time, get out your cell phone, check your email uh, <clears throat> and whatnot. But that'll walk you through all these major topics and give you in print the biblical uh, basis for these things. But union with Christ is not just the first in the series, it's the foundation for the whole. Because every other gem Every other link in that chain that you will be looking at this summer has its foundation in our union with Jesus Christ. A union which, as we will see, begins in eternity past and reaches its consummation in eternity to come. Every blessing that we have, we have in union with Christ. And it has been appointed for us from before the foundation of the world. With that idea in mind, what other text would we have except for Ephesians chapter 1? The text that I'm going to read runs from verse 3 down to verse 14. 
In the Greek text, this is all one sentence. No English translation committee that I know of has been able to hold its breath that long. They got to stick in a period somewhere along the way because English readers are not going to stick with it that long. But it'd be well for you to think of it as one long connected sentence because there isn't a break between eternity past and eternity to come. There is nothing going to stop the plan of God to secure that which he chose before the foundation of the world and accomplishes in the consummation of the world. Paul gives it to us not as a doctrinal discourse, but as a song of praise. This is a doxology. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Union with Christ has its foundation in the eternal counsel of God. Before the foundation of the world, before it had been created, God chose his people in love. The people of God who will be saved never in the mind of God existed outside of their union with Jesus Christ. From the very beginning of the world, they were chosen in Christ and they were chosen in love. Now, as we will see, the fact that we were united to Christ already in the eternal counsels of God does not mean we have always lived in a communion with Jesus Christ because as Paul makes clear in Ephesians 2, which we'll read in a little bit, we were actually born in trespasses and sins, dead in our trespasses and sins, and alienated from the life of God. But though alienated from the life of God, dead in our trespasses and sins, we belonged in the eternal counsels of God as the people who had been given to Jesus Christ as his inheritance. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. We were as sons living in the far country. We were as prodigals that had gone astray. We were as sons who sought to throw off the yoke of our father and go our own way in the world. But we were nonetheless chosen for adoption as sons. 
though we were, as it were, born as illegitimate children in the world. We had become, instead of the children of God, the children of the devil. We were by nature children of wrath, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. But in the eternal counsels of God, in love, he chose us, he predestined us for adoption as sons. He predestined us that we might share in the glory of God, to the praise of his glorious grace, verse 6 says, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You know, union with Christ is a doctrine like the Trinity in this sense. The name of the doctrine is not actually found in the scriptures. You won't be able to look up in your concordance union with Christ. Unlike the doctrine of the Trinity, we have something that's much closer to it. We don't have anything close to the word Trinity in the Bible. We've got the concept. The concept is the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet they are not three gods, but one God, taken from the Athanasian Greek. That's a summary of biblical teaching, but it's nowhere found in that concise of form anywhere in the Holy Scriptures. And the word Trinity was made up to name that combination of passages and how they are to be brought together, affirming that there is one God and there are three persons in the Godhead. The union with Christ is somewhat like that in the sense that the exact word for the doctrine is not found, but something very close to it is united with Christ. That may be found in the scriptures in Romans chapter 6, but you find it more in a phrase that you might be tempted just quickly to pass over. It's the phrase in Christ, or something like it, with Christ, or through Christ, or even into Christ. That is pointing you to a reality for which thanksgiving could never be adequate. That we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Some theologians like to speak of a covenant that had existed among the members of the Trinity as they purposed the creation and the salvation of people in the world. That the Father had chosen a people and the Son had agreed to give himself for those people and the Holy Spirit would uphold the Lord Christ in the work of saving that people and then apply the work of new life into the hearts and lives of the people that Christ had saved, that there had been a covenant. Well, that covenant was the covenant of love that brought us into a union with Jesus Christ. But at that point, it was, we might say, just a federal union or a legal union or a covenantal union Because as I said, when we actually came into the world, unless you were a John the Baptist that had been filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, and I can tell you, according to my parents, I gave no evidence of that. (laughs) You and I were born dead in our trespasses and sins. And Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We weren't born in a living communion with Jesus Christ. We were born alienated from the life that is in God. And we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were spiritually dead. It would take a work of utter transformation on the part of God to make us anything other than that. He would have to, in the language of Ezekiel chapter 36, take out the heart of stone that was in us and put in a new heart, a heart of flesh. He must put his spirit within us in order that he would cause us to walk in his statutes. We had to be made altogether new from the inside out, from the very depth of our being, because we weren't born as the children of God. We were born dead in our trespasses and sins. But Paul goes on. 
but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. As we saw from Ephesians 1, that love goes back before the foundation of the world. When in love he predestined us to adoption as sons, when he chose us in Christ, in love, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive, together with Christ. There's that phrase again, with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It's always in Christ Jesus. We never stand alone before the Father. We never have. In the mind of the Father, we always stood in Christ when in love he had predestined us to adoption as sons. He had chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We had never stood alone in the Father's mind. We were always united to Christ. And though we were born as children of the devil, dead in our trespasses and sins, because of the great love with which he loved us, before the foundation of the world, he made us alive together with Christ. It was in Christ that it took place. And if we went to Romans chapter 6 or elsewhere, because uh, this idea, though it's not found anywhere under the name union with Christ, it is found everywhere in the phrase union with Christ, in Paul alone, over 200 times, whether it's in Christ, into Christ, through Christ, with Christ. Paul's our main source, but he is not the only one. It is everywhere that Christ is is and does. In John's gospel, for example, why does Jesus come into the world? He came into the world to save those that the Father had given to him. But when did he do that? Well, it wasn't yesterday. It wasn't at the beginning of your life. He gave you to Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. And when Jesus came into the world, it was for you to gather you together to him to restore you to adoption as sons, to make you into children of God. He made us alive together with Christ. But to do that, you see, he had to purchase that. And this helps us to see another aspect to union with Jesus Christ. When did he purchase us? Well, it was at the cross. On the cross, we were united to Jesus Christ so that when he died, we died. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You were federally, covenantally, really with Christ when he died upon the cross. Your sins had been laid upon him. That's why he went there. So when he died, we died. When he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead because as Psalm 16 says, it was impossible for the grave to hold him. Why? Because he was God's holy one. He had lived out faithfully all the obligations that had been laid upon us as the creatures of God. Jesus had taken all those obligations upon himself when he united himself with our flesh, when he became one with us in our humanity. He assumed upon himself all that was required of us and he lived it out faithfully. God had promised to the whole human race in Adam that if we would live in obedience and faithfulness, we would eat the tree of life, which we know to be a tree of everlasting life because it shows up again at the end of the Bible Revelation 21 and 22, there it is in the midst of God's city, a tree of life which is bearing fruit in 12 months out of the year for all the 12 tribes of God that have been gathered from the nations. We will feed on the tree of life forever. That's what was before Adam in the garden. But Adam had turned aside. 
And when he turned aside, you and I turned aside. When he was kicked out of the garden, you and I were kicked out of the garden because we had been united with Adam. But in Jesus Christ, we were raised anew because he had not turned aside. He had faithfully done all that God had laid upon us. When he had been circumcised at eight days of age, the obligations of the Abrahamic covenant had been laid upon him. Walk before me and be blameless that I may establish my covenant with you. And he did indeed fulfill it to the very end. And so what God had promised to the righteous, to the perfectly, perpetually righteous, he gave to Jesus Christ. But because we were united to Christ, because we were in him, we received the benefit that he had earned. We get it by his grace. He got it by his merit. But he did it for us. So Paul says we were raised up with him. And then more, it goes on, not only were we raised up with him, we were seated with him in the heavenly places. That when Christ was raised from the dead, he would 40 days later ascend into heaven to the right hand of God. There he would sit as king of kings and lord of lords. And we have been raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. We are so tied to our flesh and blood, we can't really see the other world. It takes a supernatural work of God for us to see angels in the scriptures. We can't see the unseen world that is all around us. If we could, we would see that we have, as it were, a place in heaven already because we have been raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. You know, one of the places where that comes uh, into play for us is actually in the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. At the time of the Reformation, there were titanic debates over just what was going on in the Lord's Supper. It's hard to imagine. But the thing that kept the Lutheran and the Reformed from uniting together in the 16th century was the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther was utterly convinced that when Jesus Christ said, this is my body, he meant it literally. And that somehow or other, when we ate the Lord's Supper, we were masticating on the flesh of Jesus Christ. That we were actually drinking down the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe it in a Catholic sense. He didn't believe that the substance of bread had been changed into the substance of the body of Christ. He didn't go into those Aristotelian distinctions between the form of a thing and the essence of a thing. But he did believe that somehow or other, in ways that we could not fully explain, that Jesus Christ was physically present, that he was there, that he was being chewed upon, that he was being drunk in, because in, with, and under the blood, or the, the wine and the bread, were the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. As perhaps you know from Reformation history, Ulrich Zwingli thought that was nuts. <laughs> that Jesus Christ in his physical body was at the right hand of God in heaven. He wasn't down upon the earth. So there was tremendous debate over where was Christ in the Lord's Supper. And some thought of his presence as a physical presence. And others, like Calvin, wanted to insist upon a spiritual presence. But Calvin had a little twist on that. And it relates to Ephesians chapter 2. Because for Calvin, the important thing about the Lord's Supper is not whether we can specify where Christ is at the moment that we celebrate the Lord's Supper, but where we are. In the Lord's Supper, we are lifted up to where Christ is in heaven. Our union with him is a fellowship and a communion with Christ in his heavenly session. That there we don't just live with him, we reign with him. We are already victors in the spiritual battle that must be waged here. There's a very important sense in which our battle has already been won because it has been won by him. Jesus said that at the end of John chapter 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. 
I have overcome the world. And because of our union with Christ, we also have overcome the world. We don't have to live in slavery to its passions. We once were slave to its passions. But now we have been made alive together with Christ, raised up with him and seated with him. So that you see, because of our union with Jesus Christ, when he died, we died. It means that we were there when he died. And it also means that when you die, he is there. He has united himself to you. His last words in the Gospel of Matthew had promised, I will be with you all the days to the end of the age. You know, one of the problems I have <clears throat> with the New International Version, I don't mean to knock this entirely. There are many wonderful advantages to the New International Version. I recommend it myself. If people come to Christ in their adult years and they didn't have any real background in the Scriptures, the NIV is a much easier reading Bible and so on. But one of the nagging things that they do in that Bible for me is that they drop many of the logical connectives and little particles that are in there. And one of them is in the Gospel of Matthew where time and time and time again, more than 60 times in the text, he uses the word that normally we translate in English, behold. It's the Greek word to do. The NIV almost always leaves it out. Why? Well, because we don't talk that way today. We don't use that word. You know, I didn't walk in here, behold. It is my great pleasure to be with you here today. I, had I said that, my kids wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they thought I'd lived in another century, and I actually was a pastor in another century in this church. But they thought I went further back in time. But we don't talk that way today. And the NIV sought to bring the New Testament into the language of the day. So they typically drop it. But even they couldn't afford to drop it there at the end of Matthew's Gospel. They've got to stick it in there. And certainly and surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. It's there to underscore. It's there to emphasize. It's there to make sure you don't miss it. I will be with you. There have been many articles on the news lately dealing especially with the elderly, but not just with the elderly. It turns out to be an affliction of the young as well. It's the affliction of loneliness. So many people living alone. And even people living with others in their family in the house can still be dreadfully alone. And people can be surrounded by people in all their life and in all their associations and still be dreadfully alone. And part of the good news for a Christian believer is that you are never alone. You could indeed be the only one in the room. You could be the only one on your side of the globe. And you would never be alone. Those of you that wish you were married, believing your life would be so much better if you were, those who are widowed, who look back to a time when your life is so much better than it is. You actually right now possess a husband, a spouse, who is better than any earthly spouse. You are never alone. He is with you always to the end of the age because when he united himself to you, he did it forever. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. The love and companionship that you have known from a spouse or from a family or from friends, all of that was just a copy and a shadow of a heavenly reality, of the greatest friend, the greatest spouse, the greatest brother that there could ever be. He has united us to himself in love. You will never be alone. He has promised it himself. I am with you always to the end of the age. 
we could disintegrate into dementia so that we are unable to communicate with those round about us. We may know what we want to say, we just can't say it. They may have some idea of what we want to say, they just can't understand it. But Jesus Christ knows every thought and intention of our heart. And he will bring us into wholeness and healing and take away all of that. We are never alone because he has united us to himself. He united us with himself in glory so that we were united with him when he died, when he rose again, when he ascended into heaven. And in time, he unites us to himself, as Paul says, when he causes us to be born again into this new life, when he makes us alive together with Christ, and then we become aware of that love that had been upon us from before the foundation of the world. It's brought out in the words of the hymn, I sought the Lord, but afterward I knew. He moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. Ages ago, Senator Mark Hatfield, one of the uh, most outspoken evangelical Christians uh, in Washington during those days, he had published a little book of his biography, and in the chapter where he spoke of his conversion and coming to Jesus Christ, it was entitled, <clears throat> Seeking and Being Found. <laughs> Seeking and Being Found. And what he was trying to convey by that title was just the fact that he had lived with a sense of emptiness and despair and he was looking for a home for his soul. He was looking for a place to rest. He was in search of it, and he had gone out in one way or another. And when at last he found it, he realized he had found him. His rest was in Jesus Christ. He had sought, and he had been found. That's what Paul is telling us here. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons. At some point in our life, that transformation of the heart takes place. He takes out the heart of stone, he puts in the heart of flesh. He puts his spirit within us. He gives us his spirit so that he himself may dwell in us by faith, that the Father may come and make his home with us, that we will have fellowship with all three persons of the Trinity because of the Holy Spirit given to us that Christ may dwell in us by faith. And he begins that work of sanctification so that more and more over time we are enabled by Christ to die to sin and live under righteousness. That work will come to its consummation when at last he comes again. And that work that seems to have progressed ever so slowly in our lives, that work of putting down all that is sinful within us will suddenly and completely come to an end. And that work that had been predestined from the beginning, predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, will come at last, and we will then be glorified with him forever and forever and forever. And as Newton said, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. You know, that final vision of the Bible <clears throat> is like the end of most books. Where it ends lets you know what it's all about. Where did it end? Well, it ended with a wedding. The bride of Christ descends out of heaven, prepared as a bride to meet the bridegroom. She is adorned with the glory of God. And the bridegroom who gave himself for her comes to embrace her as his own that together they may live in unbroken fellowship throughout all eternity to come. That's what the Bible is all about. Well, the Bible had also begun with a wedding. It had begun with the wedding of Adam and Eve. And Paul tells us at the end of Ephesians chapter 5 
But that wedding, that wedding in which a man would leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two would become one flesh, Paul said that was a great mystery. He meant by that not that a man and a woman could come together and somehow live in a happy union together when the one is from Mars and the other is from Venus. He didn't mean it was difficult for men and women to get together. He meant as a mystery that which hid some greater reality that awaited revelation. The greater reality which awaited revelation was Christ and his church. So it means that if Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. If, if those words at the end of Genesis 2 referred to Christ and the church, then I suppose Genesis 2.18 does too. When God looked upon the world that he had made, and he said, it's not good that the man should be alone. It's not just that men can't be trusted to take care of the garden by themselves, as any wife discovers when she goes away for a week to visit her mother. It's not just that the world seems to fall apart when a man is left alone. And it's not just the idea that a man won't be able to reproduce on his own. He will need to have a wife if there's going to be offspring. I think he meant we need Christ. It's not just that a man needs a wife. It's that men and women need Christ. And that provision had been made from all eternity when he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world and in love predestined us as sons. And because he did, then at some point in time, he will begin that work to call whom the prodigals have gone astray. They will be effectually called they will be regenerated. They will come to faith and repentance. The work of sanctification will begin in them and it will continue with them until at last he will bring them to glorification, upholding and keeping them through all their tribulations between the time of their new birth and between the time of the, uh, and the end time of the consummation. He will uphold us and keep us. No one will be able to snatch us out of the Father's hands. No one will be able to snatch us out of the hands of Christ because he has united us with himself in an unbreakable bond. No power on earth can overcome the power that grips us in union with Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, how we thank you that you loved us with an everlasting love. That you loved us even before you had made us. That you loved us, O oh Lord our God, and united us to Jesus Christ. And so we pray that we may more and more grow to rejoice and rest in this love which has been upon us. I pray, Lord, for those who do not know with any assurance that they have that love. I pray that you would so work in their hearts that they might this day come to know it. I pray for those who are now far from you, who still live in the deadness of their trespasses and sins, that you will make them alive together with Christ and raise them up with you and seat them with you in the heavenly places. Oh Lord, let your gospel go forth with power. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, gather all your children from the furthermost parts of the earth and from the very depths of sin. Gather them back to yourself and keep them unto everlasting life. We ask it all through Christ our Savior. Amen.